doesn't matter what the situation is. Starbucks, you're looking to get a, a good cup of coffee, the one you actually order, and I work international kidnappings all over the world. What you're looking for is collaboration, not capitulation, not conquest. If you want to get real agreement from somebody, you get them to say that that's right, not yes. You paraphrase, you summarize from their perspective. And there's no stronger agreement. And a lot of it is about being present, which the other side feels drawn to. They're drawn to it so much, they're actually undergoing neurochemical changes, all of which are heavily biased in your favor. Nobody really talks about how powerful that stuff is. Deals make themselves. Relationships heal. It was quite shocking the first time I read it, and then afterwards it was shocking that I didn't already know this. There are three types of yeses in the world. We'd love to hear yes. And saying it makes us nervous. People are constantly trying to trap us with yes. Would you like to make more money? Would you like to have more free time? Disguised as seeking a confirmation yes is always leading us down a path. A concept that we call the favorite of the fool. Are you the fool in the game? Are they playing you in the negotiation? This is so prevalent that it's in almost every sales book to watch out for this. Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And we have with us inspiring our evolution today, Chris Voss. Chris, how are you there, sir? Yeah, man, I'm great, man. Happy to be here. Life's good. Oh, man. It is such a pleasure to have you here. For those that are tuning into Chris for the first time, please let me do the honors. Two quick sex. He's an American businessman, author, and academic. He's a former FBI hostage negotiator and the CEO now of the Black Swan Group. We are going to find out all about Black Swans today. And uh, well, actually, they were something related to Western Australia at some point. So we're going to dive into that. And uh, he's the co-author of the book, Never Split the Difference. Mate, Never Split the Difference is such an incredible book. Thank you so much for writing it. Thank you so much for the work that you do. It is such a pleasure to have you here again. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I wanted to tune in and just check, like start at sort of the, the, just getting some context into like you and your life because uh, ne- like FBI negotiation is, I imagine, not for the faint of heart, right? It's quite high stakes. Even listening into the stories in the book, um, there are lives on the line. Um, and even just, you know, when it comes down to the certain words that you're choosing in certain conversations, what was it about Chris? Like, do you ever look back at young Chris, Chris before the age of like, like nine and seven and say, oh, this guy was always kind of geared for this trajectory. What was it about you that brought you into this space? Or Yeah, no, I, I, into it? I, don't, I don't know that I was uh, geared for it per se. Uh, you know, the universe definitely guided me in that direction, whether I wanted to go to or not. But I think I've always been somebody, I come from a figure it out background. You know, pitch in, figure it out, solve the problem. And that's what great negotiation, certainly what hostage negotiation is about. Um, You know, do the best you can, figure it out. Um, And that's probably, you know, my father was a a small businessman, sole proprietor, entrepreneur. He put his kids to work for him pretty much as soon as we were capable of taking out the trash. You know, he wanted to learn to work, work for a living to begin with and work hard and pitch in. And so that was our family environment. I mean, I started working for my father at a very early age and given tasks to figure out. Like one one year, I think I was about 11 or 12 years old. Uh, my dad told my older sister and I had to go in the backyard and tear down the garage. He wanted a new garage. And we were big enough to uh, to hold uh, crowbars and hammers. And he said, you know, Sounds go, like go figure out how to tear that. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty close. <laughs> And so he just put you, he, you, he was, anything was figure outable is what I'm hearing. He can put you to task. I, yeah, I think that's the way he grew up. You know, think for yourself, tackle a problem, um, be basically optimistic. I don't know that we ever said that per se growing up, but I think I, I grew up, if you, if you have a can do attitude, then by definition, you're, you're kind of living by an optimistic value. You know, we can get it done. If you can't do it, you're optimistic. And I think optimistic as well. Is the optimistic orientation a positive one when navigating certain things like conflict? Because negotiation often feels like conflict for people. 
how important is that optimistic orientation? Ah, oh, it's critical. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to influence every thought you have. Um, I quoted this about a thousand times, and I'll quote it a thousand more times. Sean Acker did a, a TED Talk uh, called The Happy Secret to Better Work. He's a Harvard psychologist. I don't normally quote psychologists, but I'm satisfied that he, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, he said, you're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind. And then, of course, his TED Talk is hysterical. It's one of the funniest TED Talks I ever heard, <laughs> which makes sense. Um, but you get if you're to be at your your best mental peak, to be your most optimum, you got to be in a positive frame of mind. If if you're thirty one percent smarter in a positive frame of mind, then that means if you're in a negative frame of mind, you're by definition thirty one percent dumber at least. Mm. And you're not going to solve complicated, challenging, intense problems in a in a dumber frame of mind. Some of those dark situations you've been in, I imagine it must be pretty difficult to bring an opt- sense of optimism to. Like you're negotiating for situations where people's lives are on the line. Even sometimes people have bunged up and made mistakes, which could cost someone a life and somehow you've miraculously come back from those situations. Is there like a... Obviously, you're not, I imagine you're human. Um, is there a coaching that you do of yourself to maintain a certain level of optimism through the through the through situations? And if so, what do you what do you like to sort of remind no, us? Well, I think what carried me through that time frame especially was I felt it was a privilege to do it. I mean, I, I genuinely felt like it was a privilege. And anything that you're doing, if you feel it's a privilege, um, then you're going to find the energy for it. And you're gonna you're gonna be resilient, if you will. Uh, even when it goes bad, you're gonna feel like you you did your best. I mean, you learn sort of the hard way if you do it long enough. There's no such thing as a guaranteed success. There's just best chance of success. And then your best chance of success operate in a team. You know, don't, don't try to. You're not a gunslinger as as a hostage negotiator, or as a business negotiator. If you think you're a gunslinger, you know, this person by yourself, then you're just not going to do as well. Uh, you're going to you're going to be defeated more often than not. So and I wasn't a gunslinger. I didn't I didn't look at it. I always like to have at least one wingman, at least one person to bounce stuff off of to try to make my thinking better. Yeah, I find that really interesting, the sense of how much of human living is relationship? Because as you mentioned, you went from FBI negotiating to now supporting business negotiating. And as I said to you before, I was getting people like, as I was readying for myself for this podcast, I made a little post saying, Hey, we've got Chris Voss coming onto the podcast. And a lot of the, like not all of them, but (laughs) I think maybe 10 to 15% of the comments were like, can you help me negotiate with my kids? (laughs) 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 <laughs> and, uh, and it, it is uh, i'm not going to ask you that question but what no, I, must... I mean i'd go there i mean i got plenty of thoughts on that if you want to go there too. yeah maybe we can but before we do let's let's sort of just remark upon the point and i'd love to get your insights on just how prevalent negotiation really is in society because until us until i started coming across your work i don't realize how many dimensions i'm actually conducting negotiations in in my life like it just I just sort of go about my daily business and I didn't realize, oh, this is a negotiation. That's a negotiation. It feels like maybe I'm too steeped in the research for this podcast right at the moment, but it feels like almost everything where I'm interacting with another human being can some shape, form or other feel like a bit of a negotiation. Can you speak to where negotiation shows up in our lives? Yeah. Yeah. Well, anytime uh, the commodity that is always involved in every negotiation is not money. The commodity that's always involved is time. So anytime that you're seeking collaboration, you know, if the words I want or I need are coming across your lips or in your head or in your counterpart's head, you know, I I want you to get this report done on time. I need directions. Uh, I want a decaf latte uh, with a shot of vanilla. You know, anytime the words I want or I need and uh, collaboration, you know, that the actions of more than one person is involved in creating an outcome, which is why it's a negotiation at Starbucks. I, I'm i in a conference a couple of years ago, 
and I'm laying out to everybody how, you know, any collaboration is a negotiation. The most dangerous negotiation is the one you don't know you're in. Gentlemen at the conference had started this sort of global phenomenon called secrets. Tell me your secrets anonymously. I will share them with the world so that people don't feel alone. And he comes up to me after the conference and he says he gets a star, brand new Starbucks uh, coffee cup in a wrapper sort of as proof of employment. And a note from the Starbucks person said, I give decaf to people who are mean to me. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and then I'm telling that story. And there's no shortage of people that have worked as waiters or waitresses in restaurants. And they said, yeah, you know, we got we got a, a patron of the restaurant that in for dinner that's a jerk. And if they ask for decaf after dinner, we give them fully caffeinated coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's just an everyday interaction, isn't it? That's just yeah. you know, It's everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I, the point being, <laughs> the most dangerous negotiation you're in is the one you don't know that you're in. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I find that really interesting because so much of human dynamics is a part of everyday living. There's um, there's one thing that really was quite... Uh, I love the way you've written the book. It was quite shocking the first time I read it. And then afterwards it was shocking that I didn't already know this. There are three types of yeses in the world. And that for me was just like, how did I not fucking know this before? Like, cause once you explain them, I'm like, oh, wow. And I should let you explain the three yeses and the differences between them. Yeah, sure. It's commitment, confirmation and counterfeit. And, and, and you're sort of shocked at how you didn't know that because as human beings, uh, we're using them all the time without realizing it. And the real essence of empathy is not what it is to you, what it is to the, what is it to the other person? Not what it is to you to say it. It's different to hear it. Like we love to hear yes. And saying it makes us nervous. And so, and people are constantly trying to trap us with yes. Would you like to make more money? Would you like to have more free time? Would you like to live in a bigger house? Do you like water? You know, that the what in disguised as a seeking a confirmation yes is always leading us down a path. And that's so prevalent in life that we've all instinctively started to react with the counterfeit yes. And then people love to hear it so much that even if if your tone is trying to tell somebody that you've got misgivings or that you're wary or suspicious. Like somebody walks up to you and goes, would you like to make more money? And you go, yes. With a tone of voice that says, that's such a stupid question. I'm a little bit, find oh it. Uh, yeah. I'm on guard. It's incredulous that you would even ask me such an obvious question. Now you're giving me that with your tone of voice. But as a receiver who's just smitten by the word, and taught that it's success and victory. I don't hear you go, yes. I hear you go, yes. You know, I hear completely, I don't know that I've been give, given a guarded yes, if not a counterfeit yes. Uh, you know, a concept that we call the favorite of the fool. Are you the fool in the game? Are they playing you in the negotiation? Happens to vendors all the time. You know, they're the rabbit. They're driving a price down on somebody else. Somebody in a company needs to get three bids and they got a favorite they're going to go with, but they called you for a bid. This is so prevalent that it's in almost every sales book to watch out for this. And a sales book that I was reading the other day said, ask them, are we the vendor of choice? Now, if they're playing you, they're going to lie to you. They're not going to say, no, you know, now that you asked, we have no intention. We're just using you to drive the price down on the company we really want to go with. We had to get three bids, and you're one of those three bids. Like asking that yes-oriented question, as that's a that's a recognition that it's such a problem that every salesperson should watch out for. 
but they're gonna go or oh, well, yes of course you are why yeah we would yes we would never talk to you if we you were to find a choice <laughs> yeah. no, i would never do that i mean you're gonna get nothing but the counterfeit yes and so the the sales book that gives that advice they said ask him if you're the vendor of choice and then boom now you're continue to walk into the trap and you're saying to yourself what happened what was the counterfeit yes and like, how do you avoid a counterfeit yes? Don't try to get yes at all. That was very mind boggling. <laughs> yeah. First came across never split the difference. My whole life, every time I was trying to even influence anybody and, you know, as a coach, you're trying to influence positive outcomes for your clients. Um, and actually your story of, when you were working on the crisis hotline and um, thought you had an amazing session that was good before you went into right. review, man, that right. was so illuminating for me as a coach. Um, yeah. Just recognizing that I'm probably t- oversharing and there's lack of context for the audience, but yeah. No, that's right. I mean, yeah. we could lay it out for them. I mean, it's a, a negotiation like any other emotional intelligence skill is perishable. Like any human, uh, Jim camp used to call it the, a human performance skill, like a sport. And Tiger Woods practiced all the time. Tiger Woods didn't try, wasn't at the top of his game by only playing in tournaments. Even to this day, when he's trying to make a comeback, does he only spend time in tournaments? No, he's practicing constantly. I'm on a crisis hotline. I get the training at the, a year earlier. I, I absorb the training. I come out of there great. But all I'm doing for the following year is applying in the skills in life situations, not intentionally working on my game, not practicing. A year later, I go in for an eval and I just get torn apart by the supervisor. And I mean, that guy, thank God it was a nice guy uh, because I was shocked that he was telling me I was so bad. But he was such a decent and genuine guy. I'm like, then I realized, you know, I've been applying the skills, but I haven't been taking the time to work on my game and and I'd gotten really bad at the time and and now like everybody in my company we're constantly working on practice small stakes practice if I can't get it in a serious negotiation you know I'm, I'm doing it with the, the guy in the airport the person behind the counter at Starbucks the grocery store clerk um, I try to get into a small stakes negotiation multiple times a week intentionally just because I got to keep I got to keep my skills sharp. See how that navigates out. What are we striving for if we're not striving for yes in a negotiation? What is the orientation um, that is well, more supportive? It, it's it's and see yes is not tantamount to agreement. I mean yes most often is counterfeit, and then on top of that, even if it's yes at best is aspirational. And what does that mean? Without how. It's useless. So you shift it into how. Or if you if you want to get real agreement from somebody, you get them to say that that's right. Not yes. You paraphrase. You summarize. From their perspective. You show them that you see it from, from their point of view. And way back when, before the book came out, you know, I'm shopping the idea and I got agents telling me, nah, no, the world doesn't need another negotiation book. You know, there are 8,000 of them out there and the world just doesn't need another one. I mean, I had, I had, I flat out was told that it didn't matter that you were a hostage negotiator. The world just doesn't need another book. So I, I find, I found an agent who was supportive, um, Steve Ross. And he, what he actually said was not, this is going to be great, but, you know, a book from an FBI agent is so really well overseas. I uh, so previously sold a book on body language by Joe Navarro, what everybody is telling you. Navarro Joe was a, a, a profiler, wrote a book on body language. And Steve says, like, you know, I know this will sell overseas, so let's give it a crack. We pulled together the proposal built exactly around what you're just asking me now. What are you trying to get somebody to say? Instead of yes, you're trying to get them to say, that's right. And I lay out in the chapter why that's what you want. You don't want yes. You're driving for that's right. 
The publishers saw the proposal and they're like, wow, nobody ever took this approach before. Nobody ever told us that yes wasn't the goal. Nobody ever laid it out like this. The publishers went nuts. HarperCollins ends up coming in in a very big way, gave us a great deal, and thought they were spending a lot of money on the book. And they have been making their money back hand over fist ever since. Because, yeah, it was another negotiation book, but it wasn't getting to yes in disguise. It is not getting to yes. It's getting to that's right, which is genuine agreement. That's right is what somebody says when they believe that what you just said was the truth. Not your truth, not their truth. It's the truth. And there's no stronger agreement. I find that really remarkable because when you're in a negotiation, generally you make the other person the adversary. And now having been steeped in your in your insights, I know that actually it's not the other person that's the adversary, it's the situation. And the other person yes. actually is your partner, which then this whole conversation around, I don't know if you call it tactical empathy, but it feels like tactical empathy and getting to that's right together. Empathy, like this whole concept of tactical empathy and why that's right is so the holy grail. Can you expand upon the necess- like the empathy and try and us getting to, to that's right and just the relationship building that that requires on the journey. Yeah, well, and to start with, I mean, um, uh, what's the adversary? Like if you're talking to somebody, what you're looking for is collaboration, N- not capitulation, not uh, conquest. And what you really need is collaboration. You need to get them to work with you in a collaborative way so the two of you solve different aspects of the same problem by collaborative interaction and you both end up better off. At Starbucks, you're looking to get a a good cup of coffee, uh, the one you actually order, and dude behind the counter is number one, trying to pay his bills by giving you that cup of coffee. Secondarily, if if he's got a broader overview, he or she, they realize that the happier you are with your experience in a Starbucks, the more likely it is that you're going to be a repeat customer. You're going to come back and they and their employer are going to prosper. So they're trying to prosper, and so are you in a, in a different way. But it's collaboration. So the adversary is not the situation. It doesn't matter what the situation is. In a kidnapping, and I work kid, international kidnappings all over the world, bad guy is looking for some sort of emotional resolution to a disadvantaged situation globally. But they're, they're looking for recognition. They're, you know, terrorism is violence in order to bring attention to a cause. So what are they really after? They're after attention. It's attention-seeking behavior. If we can cut out the need for violence in the interim, like, all right, let's figure out how we get you a little PR here. There's some legitimate aspects to what, you're, what you, uh, your demographic, whether it's your religion, your ethnicity, your geography, you know, you, you are under adverse set of circumstances. How can how can we bring attention to it so that the world collaborates to solve it? So the adversary is never the person, it's the situation. Now, it gets a little more difficult if the other person doesn't take that point of view. But that's not going to change my game because then now we get into empathy or a.k.a. tactical empathy. You know, how do I articulate things to you that draw you towards me? How do I say things that actually make you more collaborative and more agreeable. It's about the demonstration of understanding, not about understanding, not about using what I think your position is to craft a better argument, to explain my position, you know, to argue, to talk you into something. There's an interim step. It's about demonstrating understanding. Like you think that, the American government is anti-Islamic. I, you know, I negotiated as a um, uh, FBI agent in New York working terrorism, trying to get Muslims to genuinely take the stand and just tell the truth in civilian trial. And I would open up by saying to him, you feel that for the last 200 years, there's been a succession of American governments that have been anti-Islamic. That's empathy. 
I didn't agree. I didn't disagree. I said, you feel. And then I didn't follow up with, and here's why that's not true. The American Constitution, the first, uh, you know, amendment protects for, you know, all this nonsense. None, none of that. I didn't need to follow. All I needed to do was demonstrate understanding. And in that world, I'd say that to him and I'd go, yeah. And they'd wait for the argument from me or the correction and it wouldn't come. And, and internally they say, wow. You're not afraid of how I see things. We can collaborate. And that, the exact same thing happens in business. You know, in business, you say, look, you, it looks to you like I'm being greedy here. I didn't say I was. I said, that's the way it looks to you. You know, it looks to you like you got to raise your prices because your bills are not going down. You can say to your landlord, you know, you feel you need to raise the rent on me. Because your bills aren't going away. Your electricity's going up. Your utilities are going up. Uh, you know, the, your phone bill's going up. That's why you feel that you need to raise the rent. And this is literally a negotiation that a client uh, let me know. And, and the client said all that to the landlord. Gave the landlord all the reasons why they felt they needed to raise the rent. And the landlord sat there for a second and said, yeah, but... If retrain, retaining a high quality tenant like you who pays their bills on time always and causes me no problems, if retaining you is, is not raising a rent is what I need to do to retain you, I'm not going to raise a rent. Tenant never asked for it, just laid out the landlord's position. The tenant could have said, like, like, look, I, you know, I pay my rent on time. I don't bust the place up. I don't call you and complain. I'm the ideal tenant. They could have said that, but they didn't. They just laid out all the reasons that were banging around the landlord's head that justified the rent raise. And as soon as it got out in the air, as soon as the landlord heard it back, then that, that sort of corrected his thinking and thought, he thought to himself, wait a minute, but this is the tenant. That always pays her rent. I mean, I got four other tenants that are calling me at two o'clock in the morning complaining about the neighbors across the street. This person never calls and complains. I'll raise their rent, but I'm not raising a rent on <laughs> on this line. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. The demonstration of understanding, which I think is, yeah, like I love the way you've articulated that. And obviously words are precise for you, um, considering the situations you've been in as well. So what are some of the key ways that we demonstrate understanding that you have found to be the most useful as some of the low hanging fruits? Well, really um, it starts with what your gut's telling you, you want to deny what you're worried about. Uh, and if you can get past this little tweak, you know, because we call, we tell people calling these, these negatives out um, actually in clusters. Yeah. Like, like, Which is super you, intimidating when you tell me to do that. <laughs> oh, it's scary, it's scary as hell. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, the first few times, calling us out in a cluster, what is, uh, as one guy runs an uh, internet security firm, Anton, brilliant dude. And we've sold him on this. And he's going to call a client and sell a new, sell him a new server. They need a server. And we're like, all right, so write down every negative reaction this client's going to have. And he took it to heart. He'd never done it before. And he came up with like this long list. And he worked on it for three nights. And he said every time he went through the list, it made him feel horrible. I mean, he just, he felt horrible because he'd never done it before. He didn't know the outcome. He didn't, he didn't see the, you know. The, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is actually daylight versus a train coming at him. So he lays all this out and he finally screws up the courage. He's like, I don't know, but these black swan guys, you know, this guy Voss and his son Voss, you know, they're saying this is going to work. Ah, he sells a client three servers. He's worried about selling one. Like he gets all this negativity out in the client. It clears their head. It clears the other side's head. It opens them to the possibilities. 
And in many cases, they bring the deal to you. And he got back to us. He says, you're not going to believe this. You know, I, I felt literally sick to my stomach when I was working on this list. And if I'd have known how good this was going to work, I, <laughs> I wasted all that time feeling horrible. The um, You call the list, uh, is it the objection audit? What do you call that list when you... Accusations audit. What's accusations the, what audit. are the accusations they will make? What will they accuse you of? Not what you, what you will accuse them of. It's, what will they accuse you of? Yeah, it's it's counterintuitive to to yeah. start there. Yeah, but then also one of the things you just described, which <laughs> and you mentioned this early stages in the book as well, I had to chuckle to myself because there's the you said there's four people in any negotiation between two people, like two human beings, four voices talking, <laughs> and. It, and I was like, oh, shit, that's so true. <laughs> I could totally relate. It's like when someone's negotiating something with me, there's the voice that is like speaking outwards to them. And then there's the inner amorite voice, which is like, okay, so what is it? And it's like doing all these calculations or all these thoughts. Like, actually, how is this going to go? And it's like, da 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 And there's like the inner voice. And I'm talking to that voice while I'm talking to this person. And then the realization as I was reading your work, which was like, oh, of course, that's fucking happening for the other person as well. So there's four of us. And I can barely listen to myself, let alone listen to the other person. And I'm doing all this like judo shit. <laughs> and I'm like trying to be actually talk to you. And it's like, actually, whoa, if I was just able to call out everything that was meant to be going on in their head and just put it on the table with them and then just listen, at least we're present, right? Like there's a whole, the dynamics change completely. Exactly. And a lot of it is about being present, which the other side feels drawn to. You know, the phrase, interested people are interesting. Like if they feel you're interested, you're present and you're listening and they're drawn to it. They're, they're drawn to it so much. They're actually going undergoing neurochemical changes, all of which are heavily biased in your favor. And it, it just, it feels so satisfying. And we talk about it and people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, in most of the negotiation, communication advice, nobody really talks about how powerful that stuff is. And deals make themselves. Relationships heal themselves by just being really interested, very, really present, and then having the courage to call out what they feel. In a in a fearless manner, because then you look fearless. Chris, there's a trippy dippy question I wanted to ask you today because I've had um quite a few guests on recently talking about just the state of the world and our own nervous systems and regulating that stuff. Nervous system regulation, like co-regulation in a conversation, is that something that you're aware of or is that something that you strive for? Or is it don't have to go that deep into your system to yeah. Yeah, no, I, well, I'm, I'm aware that if I'm in a negative frame of mind, um, fear and fear comes in so many different disguises, uh, anxious, concerned, apprehensive. I mean, fear has a lot of different faces, but I know it's, it's, it's killing my intellect. Um, fear is the mind killer. As a matter of fact, is one of the statements. I just can't think as well. I'm not as resilient. Like there's a long list. And, you know, because of that, you see reminders everywhere how to deactivate our fears, how to deactivate our amygdala. You know, like uh, a number of years ago, uh, I think No Fear was a very popular T-shirt. And, you know, getting rid of uh, our fear centers in our amygdala, like the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, right? <laughs> yeah. That's a global bestseller. And I've taken the time to dive into that long enough. It's all about deactivating fear. Like what happens if you don't give an F? Like you've deactivated your fears. Most of that not giving an F about is what we're afraid people will think. Other people's perceptions, yeah. Other people's, and then, then even, you know, the ability, the critics, you know, cancel culture, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It's always a minority. Like it's such a minority that one of the ways that I deal with it, you know, I, a uh, friend of mine, Eric Barker, wrote, writes this great uh, blog called Barking Up the Wrong Tree, which I still 
I read on a regular basis. And his book by the same title, Barking Up the Wrong Tree. Very useful book. Eric tells me about 10 years ago, he said, for every one hater, you got 10 fans. So I'm like, oh, every time somebody criticizes me, that's a good sign. That means I'm picking up fans. Like the more critics I get, you know, and I'll put, I'll put a post on Instagram, you know, I'm at the FBI negotiator on Instagram, for those of you out there that care. And I'll almost always get a, a contrary remark, some sort of criticisms. And once uh, a guy says, uh, I, I got, you know, I probably got 10, 15 critical remarks on a post. And somebody posted, doesn't that bother you? And I said, do you look at the ratio? Like I, I easily had 2,000 to 15. And this person, a fear-driven person is like, oh man, get bent on it to 15. You got to stop doing that. No, I get 2,000 people loving it. But seeing that, you know, uh, discarding uh, the critics, not giving an F. How do you do that? How do you deactivate your amygdala? One of the ways I do it is know that for every one critic I have, I get I get 10 fans. And I'll take that. I'll take those odds and I'll make a very good living off of it. <laughs> I love that. It really helps. Yeah. To keep that in mind, even as a content creator for myself, I, yeah, I, that's wisdom that I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna need. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, these questions, I always thought that what, where, when, why, how, and maybe because I'm an engineer and a project manager by background, these were always questions that were available to me. Um, in a negotiation, you've sort of ironed out, well, there are times down the line to sort of go into when and where and sometimes why, but really it's, I've been finding myself reframing any of my questions into how do I turn this into a what and a how questions. It's so simple. It's so subtle. Even in the last three weeks that I've been applying this sort of strategy, I've been noticing significantly different outcomes. <laughs> Can you tell me what it is about what and how? Well, explain us why you lean into what and how questions over any of the other ones. Well, people love to be asked what to do or how to do it. It feels very deferential. It feels good to the other side. Uh, so then it en encourages an answer. It encourages a collaborative answer. Uh, it also calls for in-depth thinking. On my part? Like you get or real the other good part? answers. What's that? On my part or the other person's part? Uh, well, actually, uh, it's on both. Now, it's going to impact the other side, the person hearing it, what Danny Kahneman would call uh, in-depth thinking or slow thinking. You know, uh, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, Nobel Prize winner, Behavioral Economics, 2002, around prospect theory. But, you know, and Kahneman stuff is worth reading. I mean, very cerebral, very smart, very in-depth guy. It is, his stuff is not a light read and is enormously valuable. But he talks about slow, in-depth thinking. And the questions, if you if someone asks you a what or a how question, it says stop you in the tracks, really contemplate, try and really give a really good answer. And then the fact that you formulated it just shows that you're trying to get a good answer out of somebody. It creates a lot of space between the two of you that's not all the time, just that much more than anything else creates great collaboration. And every now and then somebody will discard it. And then what happens is you just learned about that person. You got smarter about them. So anybody that doesn't collaborate in the face or what or how question, you just find out who you're really dealing with. And some people will not collaborate. and Either they never will, or the amount of time it takes to get them to collaborate isn't worth the return on your investment. So somebody who discards collaboration early on, that's a data point that you really need. Because the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. And if they're discarding collaboration now, that's quite likely to continue. Yeah, because taking the time to, I didn't realize how many why questions were just 
my part of my natural operating system. Cause I was just like, why are we doing this? And what, what, like, you know, and I would say something like that. Like, why are we doing this? To which I would get immediate pushback. It's like, uh, like why not? Like, why I put this person this I can feel it coming from them now and obviously tuned into your work I can feel it coming from them where it's like I go now it's okay that's my question I still have that question it comes to me in why format I have to admit that and then I go okay how do I turn this into a what and how and I've you know what's the objective and I'll simply ask that question and I think I'm sharing this because it somewhat summarizes a lot of the lessons that I took away from your work which is now that I've gotten to what is the objective, the other person is now my, I've not, and I'm, it's, it's so simple, the difference. Why are we doing this to what is the objective? We're now working on it together and they're on my side and I'm like working with, and they're working with me to go, actually, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, we don't need to do this no more. And that's been an outcome and it saved me a bunch of time and energy and effort when I've been doing things in, in like particular areas. I, I use it with my team now. It's like, you know, why are we doing it this way? Like, what's the objective? And then they'll come to task and they'll show up in a very different way to like, okay, this is the outcome that Amrit's trying to achieve or we're trying to achieve as a team. And it's like, okay. And they just engage themselves in a very significantly more solution oriented way. I find it remarkable. One of the other biggest questions I've taken away from your work is, um, and I feel like this is a hack. How am I supposed to do that? (laughs) Can you tell us about this question? Because I feel like it's an absolute hack. Can you tell us a little bit about where, like where you use it? And just, it's, it's so good. (laughs) Yeah. the, The power of that originally came from a drug dealer in Pittsburgh. And I saw this guy completely turn around in negotiation. Another drug dealer kidnapped his girlfriend and they were struggling over proof of life. And at the time I had previously worked a kidnapping that had gone bad and somebody had gotten the hostages on the phone in that case, not us in a kidnapping. So, you know, I were dumbfounded by two things at the time. Like who needs to get a hostage on the phone other than us? And then how do they do that? Like, I, we, they, we never get them on a the phone. And now a hostage is on a phone. Somebody out there is doing this. And it's just, it's stuck in my brain well after this kidnapping that ended up going very badly in so many ways. Um, and then I hear this drug dealer on drug dealer kidnapping in Pittsburgh. And the victim drug dealer says, uh, hey, dog, how do I know she's all right? And there's this long pause and a drug dealer on the other end of the phone goes, uh, I'll put her on the phone. I'm like, how? The how question that just threw this guy for a loop. And so we just extended it into different versions. You know, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to get you what you want if I don't get what I want? You know, all, all different versions of that. And how am I supposed to do that emerged as the way to be just like a, a changing the tables dramatically. Nine times out of 10. And it, and the good news, bad news. Good news is nine times out of 10 vastly changes the dynamic. The bad news, one time out of 10, it doesn't. It'll get thrown back in your face. But if you did something that worked like a magic spell nine times in a row, then the one time it backfired on you, I have so many people who have said, oh my God, it didn't work. And My answer to them was, no, it didn't work. It just gave you a different answer. That was the thing that I was talking to you a minute ago about collaboration. Like, if I can't get you to collaborate with me, you're that one in 10. I need to know that right away because now I got a hard decision to make, but I've, I've just gotten, you know, a cold water dose of reality. This is the way this situation is. And I, that I may not like the information, but I am smarter. And nine times out of 10, how am I supposed to do that? The other side goes like, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, you can't, which is the most common response. Either they say, no, you can't. You make a good point or or they change it up. They say, okay, they start giving you answers. And your reaction to it is is the same reaction that everybody has who starts using it. Like, this is a magic spell. (laughs) You're turning things around. 
Yeah. I find that really incredible. There's also a real invitation in your work to listen. So, well, silence, silence, like employing silence as a, as a strategy. And it's, it's almost up there with me. And I'm an interviewer. Like I interview a lot of people. I engage silence regularly, but when I'm having my day-to-day interactions, it's a different format to what we're doing here. When I'm in high stakes conversations, I avoid silence. I've noticed because when I'm talking, I feel like I'm more in control. And maybe that's part of the problem. Like maybe the idea is to let them feel more in control. Can you tell us more about silence and tactically employing silence in a, in a negotiation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll base it on first the three types of negotiators globally. The world splits up evenly into thirds, which is fight, flight, or make friends. Now, two out of three of those, and it's the assertive, uh, the analyst, and the accommodator. You know, the uh, aggressive, the um, the in-depth thinker, and the relationship-oriented person. Fight, flight, make friends. So the uh, the assertive and the accommodator have a horrible time being silent for vastly different reasons. The assertive, and I'm a natural-born assertive. You know, everybody is one of those three types to start with. Yeah, I'm an accommodator. You know, I <laughs> I I want to stay in control. You know, I I want to keep moving. I want to I want to keep moving forward, moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. And if I'm, you know, Ronald Reagan said, if I'm if you're explaining, you're losing, but if the assertive feels if they're explaining, they're winning. Which is why Reagan had that saying. So I I don't like silence because I feel out of control. The uh, relationship-oriented person feels out of control, but for a very different reason. Because a relationship-oriented person, interaction is their prized possession. Then the meanest thing they could do to you is go silent. Therefore, when you go silent, they assume that you're furious. So they've got to rescue you. They've got to keep talking. You're silent. Oh, my God. You're mad. I said something wrong. i got to fix it. You know, i got to jump in. This is going horribly bad on me. They hate me. They're angry. i got to make friends. And so that's that's two out of three types that have, have a real problem with it. Now, the, the analytical type loves the intimacy of silence. And they feel connected in silence. You know, they want to think. They want to share the intimacy of the moment. I actually had uh, Lex Friedman, a uh, podcast that most people are familiar with. I was fortunate enough to be on Lex's podcast a couple of months ago. And I heard him in another interview talk about the shared intimacy of silence. So this is the analyst that loves it, loves the silence. For the other two types, like if, as you and an assertive, if I go silent on you, the chances you're going to bring the deal to me are very, very high. I need to shut up and let you bring me the deal. And the very same with an accommodator. If I go silent on you, I need to shut up and let you bring me the deal. And so as, as a negotiator that has come to understand the, the immense value of silence, uh, Mark Cuban keeps his mouth shut because he's gathering information. You know, he lets other people run off at the mouth. I've heard him talk about this on Shark Tank. He goes last because he wants to hear what everybody else has to say. You know, he, he wants to watch the entrepreneur, how they handle themselves with objections. He's assessing your ability to be a great business partner. He's assessing your ability to think on the uh, on, on your feet. He can't do that if he's talking. He's got to shut his mouth. So silence becomes one of the great tactical advantages in any conversation once you've mas- mastered it. In, it does feel, still feels really uncomfortable. <laughs> But it's also, like you said, it's useful to know the outcomes that it's driving. Um, and, yeah, I totally agree with you in that regard of the Mark Cuban example is a really good one because it's, yeah, going to speak last. You naturally come across as the brightest person in the room because you've just gathered the most data when you finally speak. 
Um, and that's a really, really, really useful point to recognize. One of the interesting things um, that I found, well, one of the interesting, yeah, one amongst the many, um, was the, <laughs> was the um, and maybe even just the way I said that, we can definitely get into tone and we'll definitely get into parenting it in a, in a short, quick sec. But the, um, the fact that intelligent people find it harder to have negotiations, um, which... Yeah, sounds a bit self-flagellant, um, not for me, but just for anyone that's tuning in that feels intelligent and they say, oh, you know, but I think, yeah, it's worth unpacking because the the concept of openness was, I found this quite intriguing, actually. Yeah, and uh, so let's understand, it, it, it correlates, it tends to, because you got a high IQ doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad negotiator. It just means if, if I got to go to Vegas and I happen to live in Vegas and I'm going to bet, if you make me bet, I'm going to bet that your IQ is going to handicap your ability to listen because you you want to show off how much you know. You've done a lot of analysis. You've gathered a lot of data. You know a lot. This is particularly a problem with people that have advanced degrees. Or I, I spoke to a young man on the phone the other day. He's got an undergraduate degree, but he got a four point. He doesn't realize we're getting a straight A's in his undergraduate uh, degree means. What it means is that he's great at following directions. Exceptional, which in and of itself is a great talent. It doesn't mean he knows anything. But he got a four point from a major university in marketing. And he thinks that means he knows marketing. And it doesn't, but he's got this great grade point and he worked really hard for it. And he can't wait to show off how much he learned. And what, what a college degree really says is you have the ability to show up on time consistently enough to follow directions enough over roughly four year period of time in the United States that you can show up and you can get the job done. Now, how closely you followed those directions uh, and what else you had going on in your life, there's a whole bunch of variables there. And that's just an undergraduate degree. Imagine if you work so hard to get a PhD, you're going to want to show that baby off, which means you're not gathering the information from the other side that you don't, that they have that you don't know. And that the smarter you are, the more research you've done, the higher degree the more you're convinced you know, and that stops you from listening. Tone, can you bring us into 738.55? Like that was really interesting for me to learn. I know there's three voices that you generally encourage us to lean into. Um, and now when I listen to some your TED talk back and I'm like, You've nailed the FM DJ. <laughs> and is it something that you practice in your spare time? I'd love to ask that question as well. But yeah, let's, if you can, just highlight. Yeah, every, every, everything, everything is, I'm one of those people that believes that everything is learned. Everything is trained, you know. Uh, if, if, and if, if nature ain't helping you out, nurture can overcome it anyway. You can, there, there ain't nothing you, can, you can't learn or can't overcome. And so, yeah, I work very hard at my tone of voice and I think about it and I listen to it and I use it for impact because before I finish the sentence, I'm going to be, I'm going to be impacting the velocity of your thinking, the degree of your defensiveness or openness. I can, I can start to f impact it actually before I've finished speaking my first word because the brain works that fast uh, for in layman's terms. And I'm, I don't know if there's data that backs this analogy up, but I don't think a neuroscientist would really argue with me. Your cognitive brain probably moves at the speed of sound. Your instinctive brain probably moves at the speed of light. What does that mean? While your cognitive brain is still processing the words, your instinctive brain has processed the tone and is changing the way it's going through your mind. Because your gut instinct is feeding your conscious mind and leaning you in one direction or another. So my tone of voice is going to impact you positively or negatively 
before I finish my first word, let alone my first sentence. Now, a calming, soothing, late night FM DJ will tamp down your negativity. It'll start pulling you out of defensiveness. It's not necessarily going to pull you straight into collaboration, but that's the same voice that great TV news anchors learn so that they can be listened to, so that you're reassured by their tone of voice. And, um, you know, of all the news anchors that have gone through, uh, Shep Shepard used to be on Fox News in the U.S., and I can't think of, there was a woman that was uh, in the evenings, neither one of them with Fox anymore, but she was really wired, and she was, she was just high energy, and argumentative, and she had an assertive tone of voice, attacking all the time. And so, you know, he's doing a handoff one day and he's trying to pitch her, set her up. And he keep, she keeps just jumping in, you know, I, 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 I. and Shep just kept using it calming. Now, Martha, Martha, I think was her first name. You know, well, Martha. And he calmed her down and she stopped interrupting him. And he finished the promo and they were on the same team. And you know that's that's you know that's how you deal with with an interrupter. It's just relentlessly calm. Because if they're interrupting, they want to know the two of you are wired in together, that you're collaborating. And as you're calming, you're given a feeling of collaboration with people, and that's why the late night FM DJ voice is powerful on so many levels. I even love the because um, I find myself doing this unconsciously, but smiling when you're talking on the phone. And it yields positive results. That's that's the next move. Like when you can combine a downward inflecting voice with a smile, even on the phone they feel it. Even on the phone then it's a little bit of a tweak that hits the brain in a slightly different way. So now you're calming and soothing and encouraging simultaneously. That you know, that that is exactly the great combination of things to smile and be soothing at the same time people are so drawn to that and it, it takes practice it takes some effort you know you work on it and then when you work on it you do it and it starts to yield the results like they can't even see me smile <laughs> and they're reacting positively to it yeah such a true i love like yeah for those, if you have gotten to this point and don't feel like this is voodoo black magic stuff, it really try some of it at home. It is the it like I said, it it's ridiculous what what pops out on the other end. And while we're talking about home, let's let's ask that question. You said you were willing to go there. For those <laughs> that are parents that are like, I've got a two year old at home, so I've even started trying some of the what and how questions on him, and I think it's too early. <laughs> um, yeah, what are some of the uh, tips that you've got for parents that are struggling to negotiate with their kids potentially? Yeah, well, uh, here's what parents really really fall into. You know, again, Reagan said, if you're explaining, you're losing. You're constantly explaining to your kids. But what a parent really is trying to do is get their kids to make good decisions. And you get people to make good decisions by helping them think. And this gets us back to the what and how questions. Now, at some point in time, they got to be able to cognitively process information. And, you know, those cognitive abilities are actually starting to kick into gear Roughly somewhere between starting at two, evolving. There's a lot of brain chemistry that changes from four to five, even right, three to five. I mean, few human beings on earth remember anything before the age of five. Like if you search your brain, you might come up with a couple of memories. I, I can I can pull one memory from age four. I don't know what it is in our biological chemistry and the formation of the brain. But there's a lot of a lot of brain formation that's really gelling. Two, three, four, five. Lots of changes going on. So once you once you once you clear that four ish, you know, then you're helping them think. And then when they're younger, uh, most of it is trying to show them you see their emotions. You know, this is this has made you upset. You know, you uh, uh, and mirroring works well even at three and four years old 
because it helps them think. It helps them articulate. You're helping them articulate as much as anything else, but the brain is still very much in really early stages. And then the what and how questions, you know, probably up to about the teenage years, you know, then there's all sorts of additional neurochemical changes going on as kids are hitting puberty. I mean, that's why uh, Stephen Kotler in the Psychology of Flow says that pre-adolescents are running around in borderline flow state all the time. But then what human beings are going through when they're going through puberty, the mirroring seems to be an extraordinary tool for kids when your teenager is just giving you one word answers. And I've gotten feedback from a lot of adults that they're finally they're getting their teenage daughter to talk to them because they're mirroring. There's something about mirroring teenagers that they, they kind of feel encouraged by it. It helps them think. I mean, think of, think of all the neurochemical changes they're going through. No wonder they can't speak. I mean, <laughs> that's a tough time of life. And so, again, it's how, how are you as a parent trying to help your kids think? We haven't introduced mirroring in this podcast yet. Can we get in a description of mirroring for what it is for, yeah, just so people aren't miming each other? <laughs> um, yeah, can you describe what mirroring is? Describe what mirroring is? Yeah, for those that are tuning into the, yeah, like, because mirroring from what I've got, like gotten is from yourself is, when someone says something a certain way, like some, someone say no to me and I've learned to sort of then from your work go no and like ask it with a different question. Or if someone says something back to me um, to repeat what like basically the last few words or the last basic part of the sentence was back to them. Is that what you're implying when you're saying mirroring? Oh, so Amrit just played along very well. And for all of you listening to the podcast, back it up just a few seconds, 30 seconds ish, because I mirrored him. I repeated uh, one to three words and he responded wonderfully and genuinely and showed exactly how that dynamic works. So th thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I know you know what was going on. <laughs> case in point, case in point. <laughs> <laughs> And he, he came back with a very well thought out answer, very art articulate answer, full and in depth. And that's what happens when you marry somebody. Oh, man, Chris, I cannot thank you enough for writing the book. Um, I know Tara's put it together with you. Um, and like you said, you give him a lot of acknowledgement in the book as well, like incredible business writer. And also just, you you know, having having the wisdom to put, yeah, like to put into the book and infuse it, it is so approachable. Um, I think there's a lot to be said also for your ability to story tell. And you've got some really remarkable stories that you share in the book as well that really drive home the points and lessons as well. And I'm a massive fan, um, if you haven't already been able to tell. I will put a link in the show notes for everybody to pick up a copy off Amazon. Um, but also Black Swan Group, you guys are yeah, really helping um, businesses have these, craft these negotiations and outcomes that are really remarkable. Before I let you go, I will put a link to the Black Swan Group in the show notes below as well. Um, what is Black Swan? Well, it's, and, and there's one other thing I want to talk about also. I want to talk about Fireside. But a Black Swan is the innocuous piece of information that changes everything, the subtle difference that makes all the difference. And it could be a piece of information. It could be your demeanor. Uh, you know, Nicholas, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb wrote a book, 2007, called The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Improbable. I love Taleb's books. I mean, I think I have them all. Great thinking. And I was inspired by that metaphor that he used. You know, the little things that make all the difference. And there are always black swans. There's always pieces of information in any given negotiation that the other side's hold back. If you could just get them to trust you with it. The reason they're holding it back is because if you knew it, it would change everything. So, yeah, you want to know that. But you, that you need to be trusted with it. And that's what really what the application of tactical empathy is about. Getting them to trust you with their closely held pieces of hidden information. Fireside. Tell me more. Fireside is cool. Like Fireside's a subscription. Make yeah. no mistake. Yeah. It is not free. 
Yeah. It's an app that's on your iPhone or your Android phone. Go to the App Store. Yeah. It was originally pitched to us as an interactive podcast. Live yeah. interactive podcast. Bring the listeners up on stage. Let them ask questions. What in point of fact we've turned it into is live coaching. So no matter where you are in the world, you get to get coached by the Black Swan Group. We, we do an hour a week, every week. We got into it. Uh, we were about a month into it. And I said, wait a minute. This is coaching. This is group coaching. And I went back to my head of biz development. And I said, what do we normally charge for group coaching? And depending upon the package you buy, anywhere from 5000 to 25000 an hour. An hour. Fireside is $1,000 a year. And we got people signing in from all over the world because they need live interaction. They need live coaching. Mm -hmm. And the app works. We had a guy sign on from a mountaintop in Nepal. So we got people all over the world signing on and they're getting live coaching from us. So the fireside thing is turned into its own creature and it's turned into a real necessary portion of the path to mastery of negotiation. Well, I'll definitely get a link to that and put that in the show notes below as well for all those that are tuning in because yeah, one of the things I've noticed as well is you can learn all this stuff, but actually implementing it is key. And I can imagine that live group coaching session, also the accountability that comes from those group coaching sessions would be really awesome. So yeah, I, um, again, the invitation from this podcast is try at least one or two of these things on for size. Like if you can just start, like for me, it started with swapping my why sentences, uh, with how and what, and just different outcomes. Like it was just became easier to navigate dip, like conversations that weren't like a hundred, like they weren't a hundred out of a hundred in difficulty, but they were 50 out of a hundred in difficulty. They just dissipated to like a, they, to like a two out of a hundred in difficulty. Like it was ridiculous. And then you start getting intrigued into like, wow, these, these tools, these tactics, they actually really work. And like you said, the ode is to collaboration. The ode is to empathy. It's, you're not really being manipulative. You're finding a way to collaborate better. And that calls skills on your part to be that way. Chris, I'm so grateful for your work. I'm so grateful for, yeah, just, you know, it's a lifetime's work that informs this conversation. So just honoring you and your journey and the being that you are, mate, I am really grateful. Thank you so much for doing this with us here today. It has been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way to its end. Obviously, you absolutely love this podcast and I want to thank you so much for watching this all the way through. Here is another video that's perfectly curated just for you to watch as the next best video to keep your inspiration flowing, to keep you evolving, to keep you yelling. Check it out now.